more years that I did it, the less and less effective it got, right? So, so women that had been doing it for the last three years, it wasn't working anymore. And now the public has had the same concept of high protein, low calorie, high output, move, eat less, move more. It's been going on for about 18 years. So the average woman, before they see any personal trainer or nutrition coach, has tried to lose weight doing that right. twice a year, every year, and will do that till they're 65 years old. So it's not that it's not something that won't work. It's that the body is now acclimated and, and maladapted to it. So when you do it, it can make it worse without the right variations, without balancing hormones. I'm doing some other things that can optimize the system again. Let's link up with Krista on The Fix. She's a wellness coach with a focus on mental well-being and physical strength. What's going on, Fix listeners? Welcome back to our latest episode of the Fix Podcast. I'm your host, Krista Huber, and I've got a powerful guest for everybody today for this episode, and that is Vince Pitstick. Vince is on a mission, as you will hear, to really change the way that we respond to our health and take health into our own hands, change the way we interact with the medical system, and change the way we think about our diet our fitness routines, and what it actually means to focus on functional nutrition. He has a really cool backstory, his own personal experiences between dealing with health issues and autoimmune issues as a young boy to eventually dealing with drug addiction and ultimately working as a personal trainer who then got exposed to a few different companies, lots of doctors, researchers, and I will let him get into it. And and you'll hear all this within the first few minutes of the episode. But this is one of those conversations where one, if you were a coach, ton of value packed into it and understanding how we can impact our clients to get the best results possible. And two, if you are someone who cares about your health and wants to take your health into your own hands, there are things that you can do. There are things that you can look into, a lot of which his various companies are supporting and providing access to. But just reminding you that if something doesn't feel right, listen to your body and don't take no for an answer. Don't take nothing. Hey, there's nothing wrong with you for an answer. If something was working for you in the past, when it's come to weight loss, when it's come to trying to build your best physique possible, and for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to be working anymore. There are other tools to explore. You'll hear him reference various diets. And one of the words that he uses that I think is so important is the word tool. We could go on social media right now, and we could look through five posts and probably come up with six different ways that you could potentially lose weight, build muscle, insert any goal here. And what all of this comes down to is recognizing that everybody's different. We have bio-individuality. The tools that work for some person may not be appropriate for the next, but being willing and open-minded to experimentation and figuring out what does in fact work for you and supporting your metabolism to be able to handle more food is the key to living a full and healthy life. So with that, let's welcome Vince to the Fix Podcast. Vince, welcome to the Fix Podcast. I am so excited to have this conversation. Like we were saying pre-recording, we have a lot of mutual friends, have kind of sort of crossed paths, similar coaching philosophies, and just so many different things that we can cover over the course of the next hour. So first and foremost, thank you for being here. And to kick things off, I don't know if you're a coffee drinker, but I love coffee and that is my go-to question. Perfect. To get us started. So what is your coffee order? What are you sipping on in the morning? So I've now, so I am a, if you look at my genetic makeup, I'm yeah. what we call a comp T M A O A. And you may not know this, but we do gene coaching. And so oh, cool. I didn't is, know that actually. Yeah. Yeah. So what that means is, is that I detox, uh, catecholamine slowly. Okay. So adrenaline, dopamine, things like that, right? Norepinephrine, epinephrine type things. And so that means that my body is used to very high levels 
of dopamine mm-hmm. in order to perform at a high level. So like I caffeine is so it's one of those big drivers. So anybody that like cannot let go of their caffeine is usually one of those genetic Probably presets. me too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, but I have learned that there has to be this cycling. Of, mm-hmm. You want to cycle your caffeine for sure. And so I learned that I, you know, some of Huberman's work here and in, in research that he had noted too, I like to wait during the day and I only have half as much now. I do half caps. Mm-hmm. So there's this, um, uh, and again, I'll switch back and forth because I do like some of my organic coffees and different things like that too. But this is Melozio, uh, Melozio. Uh, it is a half calf that comes in the the European like um, I'm trying to think of the name of the. It's a frother, so that like it automatically oh. creates frother. It's an amazing home machine. That's so I, cool. While while we're sitting here, Melozio. Yeah, Nespresso. Okay, nice. The Nespresso machine. And I realize that some of this still, if we've got some of your ultra holistic people that may be listening to this, there probably is a little bit of acrylamide in, in the coffee. I'll switch them up. I do when I take some, some binding agents and stuff like that. But I eat so holistic everywhere else or yeah. healthy. If I get a little bit in my coffee, my I think, life, yeah, I think you can we're gonna be it, okay. Right? You know yeah, what I mean? For sure. Yeah. yeah, but that's what I, I typically drink. And then um, if I need to really turn the juice up, it'll be a Starbucks here and there. Okay. Because you know, I got the extra caffeine if nice. I can really crank it. But yeah, that's me. So Nice. Cool. Well, just from that answer alone, I think we are setting a good kind of like precursor for the audience for the rest of this conversation about all the different things that we might touch on and dive into in really taking this very holistic, well-rounded approach to health. And I know a little bit about your backstory, but I want to bring the fix listeners into that. And the way I typically ask my guests to introduce themselves is, yes, you can give me your resume. You can tell me about all your coaching credentials, all the businesses you've built, all of those amazing things. But I want to take it a step further. And I'd rather hear from you who you are at a core level and more specifically, why should we care about what you have to say? There's so many podcasts out there. Somebody could choose to listen to this show, the next show. What is it about you and who you are and what you stand for that the listener should stay tuned into this? Yeah. It, you know, one of my mentors told me um, that um, it's not that your work ethic isn't hard enough. It's that your goals aren't big enough and that when you reach a, a, um, a stall in your progression, pick a different, a bigger purpose. And so for me, what you have is a man that started off as a very, very sick, rare disease, eight year old boy failed by the medical system to travel the United States looking for solutions to discover the world of functional holistic medicine, which was pretty lax in, in you know, back in the 1990s or whatever. Um, to recover using nutrition, therapy, um, and, and other lifestyle tools like fitness to decide to dedicate his life to creating an alternative medicine health, uh, ecosystem that could take care of people outside of the Western system, all delivered by a coach and to lead a movement into functional coaching being the norm for almost everyone in America and hopefully the globe. Um, And that's my enemy is Western medicine and disease. And uh, if I have anything to say about it, by the time that my days are done, I will have changed the way that health services are delivered in the United States permanently and hopefully the world. That ultimately in a nutshell is what I am and who I am. And I did, I started out as a personal trainer, but now today have a, you know, have seven businesses that are all functional based. That is about 120 staff. That does, you know, well above eight figures. Um, That's all dedicated to help liberating people from the Western medical system and disease. Um, And that's what it is. And I'm here to empower the person that listens to this or the personal trainer or the nutritionist that you can become unlimited and do anything in health that you want. And you don't need anybody's permission. I'm living proof. I love that. There's a lot to unpack there, but why don't we start from the beginning? And I hope that's a high note. That's like a, that was a summation. That yeah, was, that was you know, great. Trying to, try to narrow it down. No, yeah. that was fantastic. I love it. And I love what you said about 
getting to those points of like, Hey, if you're feeling like you're stuck or you're stalled on something, it's not just a matter of coming back to your purpose, but can you make it even bigger? Can you think about it on that grander scale? I I love that perspective. And I think that's amazing. And I'd love for you to kind of take us back because I actually didn't know that about your story from when you were a little kid. So tell me about that personal experience that you had from a super young age. I think there's so many people out there who even on, let's call them like those micro levels of going to the doctor's office, ones that come up for me all the time with my clients is like, Hey, ask your doctor to run X, Y, Z lab work. And they come back and they're like, Oh, we don't need to run your entire thyroid. Like it's like, well, how about, cause the, the patient and my client asked, well, let's do it. Right. So anybody can relate to that, but you've obviously had this like profound experience and a long experience through that. So I'd love for you to talk us through it. Uh, I can tell you from personal knowledge that anybody that's dealing with a mental health issue, it probably didn't start in the mind. Mm-hmm. It started in the body and in your environment. So for me, I grew up on a farm uh, in the middle of nowhere uh, outside of Chicago. Okay. Um, we're a rural farm area. Uh, believe it or not, there is that outside of Chicago. You get out a couple hours. <laughs> and uh, But I was exposed to a lot of industrial chemicals. Okay. Um, and I started developing, I've got a very rare form of OCD and other psychological mixed with some physiologic issues, um, that went, went unexplained for a very long time. And so most of the doctors that I talked to and people that we came in contact with just said I was a bad kid or I had behavioral issues. And this comes up a lot, you know, we'll give people certain diagnoses today, or we'll just say that they have personality traits yeah. and we don't really know how much the environment or their diet's actually affecting it. And I can tell you unequivocally that your environment, like what you're eating, how you're living, what you're thinking has everything to do with the origin. So my family was also very chaotic at that time. I have two uh, great parents individually, but together they were very toxic. Uh, and so we had a very, very toxic, semi-insane, unmanageable uh, living experience mixed with chemical exposure. And then when you get two major stressors like that, that's where psychological or physiological disease can be born. Sure. And, um, you know, I went to many doctor's offices and they kept trying to push different pills. And early on, you know, I'm, you know, you know, just just hit 40. Uh, and you guys got to understand this is back 32 years ago, psych meds then, even now, but psych meds then were, they did a lot of damage actually. And there's a lot of reviews that have looked at some of the work that a lot of that stuff did. And I saw these kids and they were like chewing at their mouth. I'm not kidding. I mean, I see kids like rocking themselves in the corner on the different meds. I'm seeing all this and I look at my mom, I'm eight. I'm looking at my mom. I'm like, I'm not, mom, don't make me take any of these meds. I remember actually I ran out of the hospital. She had to chase me down. And I was crying. I said, mom, don't make me take these, these meds they want to put me on. She, and that's when the one thing I can tell you, my mom, she, she had an intuition about her and she knew she was like, you know what, if you don't want to, I'm not going to make it. And that's the smartest thing that she ever did. Um, and, uh, I was really grateful for that because it set me on a different trajectory. Yeah. And so anyways, but we got failed by the medical system and then, you know, started dealing with holistic practitioners. And then I got into new nutrition I got into other things, uh, health related. I got more into fitness, all that sport changed a lot for me too. And I got out of that environment. Um, and it, it really, a lot of it went away by the time I was, you know, 14 years old, but then other psychological, the problem is once you get psychological issues, you develop narratives, habits, and behaviors that become very hard to break. 100%. I had started self-medicating myself at 13 years old with medicinal drugs. So then drug addiction came after that and it almost killed me until I got sober. Um, so there was a good, you know, from eight years old to about 29 years old, I pretty much all of that life I lost. I didn't get to really be a kid. I didn't, I didn't have my twenties and, and all of that. Um, but it prepared me for what I was going to do today, which is like when someone tells me they don't, something's not right. And the doctor says, everything's fine. You know, my first job as a practitioner is to believe them. You know what I mean? And that's where I started my career. So when I was a personal trainer and when the macros weren't working and the, you know, work out six days a week, high protein, low calorie, leave you there for really long periods of time. When people said there was something wrong, it's not working. 
I didn't just go, oh, it's probably because you're messing up your macros and you're overeating. Although that can be for some people. I chose to believe them. And then it started me on a journey of like, well, what's not working if this isn't working? Right. Or if it's not working well. And that's when I developed a new nutritional system. That's why back, you know, I'm, I'm 22 at this time. And I developed a system where instead of selling a personal training package where you just got personal training, I started incorporating something that didn't exist. We called it nutritional counseling at the time. So you would buy a package with me, but the package was a system because what I realized early on is I was part of the personal training boom. People would come to you and say they wanted weight loss, but then they'd go, oh, I'm bloated and I'm depressed and I got this and I got psoriasis and I got this and the doctor can't help me. And I'm getting these questions and I'm beginning to realize, because remember, I've had some experience in functional medicine at this point. Like I know there's alternative answers. I just didn't know how to tie it all together. The only modality I was using as a personal trainer was, or was, was training at the time. And then I added nutrition, but I was using training, which is just the musculoskeletal system, which is what we'll get into functional medicine here in a minute and how you use all 11 systems of the body to try to heal them is root cause medicine. That's why as a personal trainer, the number one thing a personal trainer has over every practitioner is the relationship. And that's the number one thing that you need. That's why personal trainers don't understand that they can be the most effective tool over doctors, over anyone in making someone healthy because it's the relationship. And when you're spending one-on-one time like that, you get develop a relationship that makes them think they can do anything. And that's what you need in order to, because the psychology comes before the physiology. Right. So what I did was I leveraged that. I realized I'm not a personal trainer. Give me any title you want. Nutritionist, trainer, whatever makes you feel good. But what I actually am is a trusted guy who's a problem solver. So if you come to me with a problem, I may not have all the answers, but I want, or I might not be the entire solution myself, but I want to have an answer for you. And so what I did was I started building programs where it's like, okay, I need you to have community. So I was also a Les Mills a co- uh, uh, group instructor. So if someone bought a package, they get my classes for free. So I want them to get into community once or twice. So they're around other human beings, communicating with people, doing what they're doing. They would get one personal training session with me a week. And then they would also get a nutritional counseling session a week where we sat down and said, what were you eating this week? How can we improve it? And then I added in, you could get one adjustment a week because I was paying them if you were paying my monthly. And you got to meet with our, there was a, in this health complex I was in, mm-hmm. you got to meet with the, the first hormone clinic that ever existed, but they were endocrinology doctors, okay. but they didn't just give hormones to everybody, but right. they were, they would do the labs and stuff. Okay. So you got to meet with them. Now, remember, this was now 18 years ago. Yeah. No so one was like, what the hell like are you that. doing? Yeah. Yeah. This is when 18 years ago, they were like, Hey, vitamin D and fish oil sounds a little weird. You know, I don't know about this. <laughs> Which is so crazy to think about now, right? Right. Now everyone's like, you don't take vitamin D and fish oil? Yeah. But when I would try to give it to people at the time, I'm like, what the hell is this? Right. And so I created a system. This system got relatively popular. I got a little bit, I got a little lucky. There was a lot of reality, reality TV started to get popular. Some of them were coming out of Chicago to train with me. And I picked up a little notoriety from that. I have made mention another side note that there was a period of my life, and I don't mind sharing this, I was a I was a Chippendale, so I traveled on the weekends, right? Because I was the nutritionist for the Chippendale that gave me leverage to sell okay. contracts early on. That's how I got so many clients early that I was able to experiment a lot early on. And that's what you should be doing in personal training was reasonable experimentation, not just what your fitness influencer is telling you or not just what your cert said, because there's enough bio-individuality in each person that if you're not playing around with concepts and creating variations to perfect your process, then you're, you're sorely going to reduce your perform- like your outcomes with your clients. Uh, a head from a global health company called Metagenics okay, came in and I ended up training him. And that's why personal training is the way to get a career in anything that you want because you build relationships. So if you don't know what to do with your life, just go be a trainer for a while, meet a lot of people, and then the path will probably become clearer. I tell you that. Very good advice. That is good advice. Yeah. Um, it's because the real world's about relationships. And, and of course. It's, right? It's about networking. It's about leverage. It's uh, about relationships. Uh, and then you'll figure the rest out later, no matter what you learn in school. And, and so they were like, hey, they got tired. This is the thing, Krista. They got tired of trying to hire 
holistic health professionals to go train other doctors. Mm -hmm. They needed someone who was good at relationships, sure. someone who's good at coaching to coach doctors how to do functional medicine. So they're like, we're going to do this random thing. You didn't get a full four-year degree. You jumped out of the three-year. You have no pharmaceutical or, or uh, medical experience, but we're going to hire you. And so they took me off and had me train in California for uh, many, many months. This is where fate comes into play. They, Metagenics has a global research center. So they are a green pharmacy. They sell supplements, but it funds the research. So it funds the research in functional medicine. They train the doctors. They have a research facility called in Gary Arbor, Washington, where they're doing research of the future. I got to train under a doctor named Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Dr. Jeffrey Bland is the godfather of lifestyle and functional medicine. He was the founder of IFM. He's been the founder of many different institutes that now drive the, 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 the narrative that is holistic health and, and where things are going for the future. He's got a book out called Disease Delusion, one of the best books um, if you can read high level stuff that's ever been out. And I got to train under these amazing practitioners and they showed me this whole other that's world so cool. of yeah. and science. And I got to sit there and just train like the military for months. And it blew my mind how much I didn't know as a trainer. You know, I thought I had a, a lot of things figured out. You know, I started adding some supplements. So it's all about vitamin deficiency and then train them a lot. And protein's really important. And yes, that's generally true. Okay. But I'm telling you, there are so many other tools at your disposal that you have no clue about because it's not part of the general consensus or general conversation. And anything outside the norm is seen as different or odd or less than. And everyone's afraid of judgment. So every nutrition coach that you see or trainer, they're going to master hardcore hypertrophy training, high protein diets, low calorie, low carb. And for at least 50% of Americans, that's not what you should be doing in the beginning. <laughs> okay. It's, it's actually counterproductive. And I know this because I was training so many people like that, particularly women, because this was during the time of the women empowerment era. It was just really cool to get women into the gym where sure. they could say, hey, women lift weights too. This is yours. But I started noticing that when we trained women very aggressively, six days a week, and we added the cardio, and we did it in low-calorie environments, that their bodies started to adapt in ways that were not – their metabolisms got worse. And other conditions would start to come up, like gut issues, and then – you know, I was doing labs on them back then, and I saw that all their thyroid levels were getting low. And right. the cortisol levels were getting high. And like, and then I noticed some women on birth control were having random results. And then I noticed, Krista, because I've been doing it for 18 years, the more years that I did it, the less and less effective it got. Right? So, so women that had been doing it for the last three years, it wasn't working anymore. And now the public has had the same concept of high protein, low calorie, high output, move, eat less, move more. It's been going on for about 18 years. So the average woman, before they see any personal trainer or nutrition coach, has tried to lose weight doing that right. twice a year, every year, and will do that till they're 65 years old. So it's not that it's not something that won't work. It's that the body is now acclimated and, and maladapted to it. So when you do it, it can make it worse without the right variations, without balancing hormones. I'm doing some other things that can optimize the system again. And so most of these women today, because of chronic dieting, have way worse metabolisms than we've ever seen in human history. Like there's a lot of women walking around out there that can't eat 1300 calories without gaining weight. That's a problem. And in, in the world in which food is so available, it's a huge problem, right? And the fact that people don't even like conceptually understand what little 1300 calories is and how fast that can add up. Yeah. One of the things that people should be aware of is that yes, calories matter. They certainly do. Okay. But the number of calories that it takes to put you into a surplus should not be really, really low. That's right. a problem. So this is the problem. So everyone goes, everyone goes, oh, all you got to do is just Get yourself into a deficit and then be more active. Well, guess what? Some people are, every time you do that, you train your body 
to sit at lower and lower metabolic levels, which means that the lights in, in your house are turning down, dimming. Sure. It means it's going to slow your thyroid, glucose metabolism, liver metabolism, met metab fat metabolism. It's going to slow everything down because your body is beginning to adapt to a high stress, low calorie environment. And then when you just double down on top of it every time, now these women to get into a deficit for many of them to actually lose a significant amount of weight. As you know, Krista, the research says for you to consistently lose weight, you need to be in a 500 calorie deficit. Most people have been trying to do that by overtraining, which doesn't work. You'll never maintain your weight overtraining. It will never happen. And so now they have to eat 500 calories in order to be in a deficit. And now if you stay there, you're just malnourishing yourself causes eating disorders, causes all the gut issues, causes all these other things. And so when you look at the amount of hours people might train in a day, plus the very little of calories they're eating, they're so malnourished now as a, as a common a commonality that they're undernourished and overstressed. And it's causing all this metabolic adaptation that's making a mess out of the 50% of women who do diet a lot, you know, and, and, and there's no research on them. So then everyone acts like they don't exist. And if anyone's listening to this podcast or watching this podcast right now, you damn well know you've seen what I'm talking about, yeah. right? So let's not let our eyes deceive us just because the research says it doesn't exist. That's bullshit. Yeah, you know it's a hundred percent. And I think just touching first and foremost on the research piece that you just landed on. Use my language, by the way. I hope is okay. Oh I'm yeah, sorry. totally fine. No, fine. you're allowed. You're good. We're good. Um, it's so many people don't realize how little research is done on the female population. And the fact that I actually just had a guest on the show recently who is um, she's developed an app to support better relationships with food, specifically around eating disorders and in particular with binge eating, because there is like a lot of misunderstanding that with you think of an eating disorder, most people think of anorexia and Mo I want to say she said 94% of eating disorders or something other than that. So it only represents a small slice. And yet that's a, what a lot of like the culture and languages around it and something that the company is trying to do is create an avenue for clinical research for this population, specifically with females. So that more of this information exists because I think it's like 1994 was when females even got brought into research. That was only 30 years ago. That's really not a long time. And when you consider how much technology has changed, and I want to get back into what you mentioned even about the stress piece, right? So many people that I work with in particular, like they have, no, they know they may be stressed out and it's like a, a word that they're using, right? But they're not thinking about the impact that that has on all of the other decisions that they're making and that's keeping them stuck in this feedback loop in their mind of like, how can I accomplish this? How can I do that? How can I get this thing done? Oh, and by the way, also make some time for myself that we take that mindset, throw a diet on top of it and put somebody into a severe calorie deficit. It's like, how many times can you do that? Forget what it's even maybe doing to them physically, but what about the mental load of just feeling defeated? Yeah. So let me explain it from a hormonal perspective is this is, Please. You know, we, uh, what, what happens when you stay in, and this is why there's not caloric deficits are very medicinal. Okay. We, we don't want to demonize caloric deficits because they're no. very important. Human beings should exist in them a good portion of the year, but then also be in a surplus a good portion of the year. Okay, this is seasonal variation. There's a reason for this. And that's why we have seasons, by the way, where there's plentiful, plentiful access to fruits and vegetables and everything like that. And then there's seasons where there's less. So unfortunately, with due to, or fortunately, due to modern technology, we don't actually go through those seasons right. anymore calorically. But our body's still designed to do that metabolically. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is, is that some of the things that we have done uh, as a fitness community in leaving people in very, very long-term caloric deficits to try to reach a goal, it creates hormonal imbalances that lead to very, very large ghrelin spikes, massive hunger cravings that get so large that it leads to binging and then fear, guilt, and shame. Right. 
And just like in gambling, if you take someone who's already somewhat having an emotional hard time dealing with the world and how to control what they can't control, and you're trying to find your place in it, and you're trying to find your identity, you you expose them to high levels of dopamine, fear, and shame and something, you're way more likely to get an obsession out of it. I don't want to blame the diet community for eating disorders because it's a little tricky. Right. When you look at first world economies, people start getting more mental conditions as things become easier and like your, your immediate needs are being met. So there's many different environmental reasons for why there's more addiction, which is what eating disorder is. It's a different form of addiction. I actually have an addiction program for this. I work with many eating disorders, looking at it from we 12 step addiction, eating disorders, um, just like AA technology, we 12 step it. Uh, it's called EFF, Emotional Freedom Foundation. Uh, it's a nonprofit that I launched for stuff like this. Um, but what happens though, is if you leave somebody in those conditions too long, you are more likely to have disordered eating patterns and then potentially get an eating disorder. A little overeating is not obviously uh, an eating disorder. Uh, but 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 chronic binging as as a as a as a behavior because we're leaving people too long and that's why having seasons of what I believe are called fast feasting meaning fast eating less and mm -hmm. then feasting eating more are absolutely necessary and should be taught. Yeah, we it's need exit strategies. Life. Yeah, I think that was even my own personal experience. Like when I did first start even learning for myself before I became a coach. I too started in the fitness industry and group fitness and personal training. And I was that person that was like, I'm working out so much, but something's disconnected here. I had no concept of the calories I was consuming, was looking at it from a place of saying, okay, I'm making a lot of seemingly healthy choices, mostly whole food sources. But then you throw in like socializing, alcohol, all that sort of stuff. That's step number one for me, getting that awareness, learning how to track my food really opened my eyes to a lot in learning how to honestly manipulate my metabolism, right? And put me in that calorie deficit. But where I wound up getting stuck every single time was I do some sort of program. It'd be this 12 week window and then it would end. And there was no conversation of where do we go from here? Do you just continue to eat this way? And I couldn't continue to eat that way. So six months would go by, I'd come back and it would be this yo-yo of constantly losing those same several pounds over and over again until eventually I got to a point that the method I was using to do that didn't work for me when other things in my life changed. Like we talked about before we hit record, a lot of other stressors, personal decisions, changing jobs, leaving relationships that I got to a place where I was like, I don't give a shit about tracking my food when I have no idea what I want to do with the rest of my life, where I'm going to live, who I'm going to be with. Like it seemed moot. Right. But as you mentioned, the relationship with food was filling dopamine hits that I was looking for at a time when I was going through a really big transition in my life. And I see this with a lot of my clients. It's like, it's not that they don't know what to do. It's just that everything they've tried worked for some period and then it doesn't. So it's really getting to the root of figuring out, well, why is this not working? Like, what are these other factors in your life that are contributing to why that might not be the case? Yeah. So what if I told your um, listeners and watchers that you could restore about anywhere from on average, it depends, let's start with females, sure. about 20 to 30% of their basal metabolic rate that could also be multiplied by an activity multiplier. They could restore 30% of their metabolic rate that they used to have when they were in their teens or their 20s. Because my case study research and we have the largest between my university of 400 coaches, my two coaching centers that have about 55 coaches. And we see, I know, uh, vital coaching has seen about 55,000 people. It's one of the larger in the country. I have the sample size because also remember too, Krista, I was the functional medicine consultant for some of the biggest doctors in the country for five years after I was working for Metagenics. And I got to see all the different diseases and how it affects everybody and how they treat it differently. And I was able to learn about everything. That's why I know a little something about everything because I was the guy behind the guy working every single case. Sure. And I was the guy that would get the call at 10 o'clock at night if something wasn't, couldn't figure out a case, right? 
So that's how my unique journey of like learning everything functional medicine and then applying it into a coaching framework that really worked. Because uh, we, when we got into the field, functional nutrition didn't exist. We made the term. Like we've been here for that long. Like we created the term because it didn't exist. And what I learned is, is that you can restore a good chunk of your metabolic function if you focus on it. Because the main problem people have is not that they don't know how to diet. Right. It's that metabolisms are so slow now from chronic dieting that it's not working anymore. And then they're gaining weight rapidly when they come out. And it's this never ending cycle that they're just getting worse over. And there's so many people going through that. And there's so many other people that are just, their metabolisms continue to slow down. Their blood glucose level is continuing to go up, even if they're generally eating okay, because their metabolic rate is slowed down. And that's why it needs to be an independent biomarker of health. Like how many calories can you eat without gaining weight? Because if that number is really low, we have a problem. It should be looked at just like triglycerides, cholesterol, A1C, because it matters. Because you're going to notice, and I'm sure you know this, Krista, with the people that you've worked with. It's like you'll notice one of the things almost every one of them will tell you, almost every one of them, is that like, I don't know, I started having bloating, my metabolism started slowing down, all those things, and then I got Hashimoto's, or then I got PCOS, or then I got blank. So it's, it's, it's a metabolic marker that we should be looking at, the diminishing BMR. Now, I want to make sure we touch on this because I see it often in your content. And for anybody listening to this, you should absolutely go check out a lot of Vince's posts and the not only looking at the transformations, but the stories behind them. And a term that I've seen you reference often, and I would imagine it's related to what you're saying about BMR, just linking it to examples like Hashimoto's, like PCOS, all the different gut health issues that have become so insanely common for people and for women especially, is the term OID. So where did that start? Talk us through it. Talk me through like how it can show up. I know it's different depending on the person, but I'm very interested in this. So I'd love for you to speak to it. Um, so for there are basically two forms of metabolic adaptation or let's say metabolic resistance, meaning that metabolism doesn't work the way that it used to. So if anyone's listening, watching, if you're saying my metabolism slowed down somewhat, well, we can, let's, we can say three, okay? Three total. One is metabolic adaptation, meaning that the things I've been doing in my body have made my body downshift mm -hmm. and be more efficient with calories. That's one. Two, body composition, right? Body composition has a big effect on how many calories you'll burn in a day. And then three is disease, okay? So what people don't understand, like, for example... If you talk to anybody that goes, it's only calories in and calories out. It has nothing to do with hormones. These people have never worked with, you'll notice that they only work with young females or all men. Yeah. And it's because they don't deal with this side because they don't want to, because they're going to find out real quick how much they don't know. And these people are usually very egotistical in their nature and they can't look at any evidence that would be contrary to what their paradigm of belief is. So they'll ignore it and say it doesn't exist. But I have worked in clinics with menopause my entire life, type 1 diabetes. So, Krista, for example, if, if people don't believe it has anything to do with hormones, take no further look at type 1 diabetes. So if you know anything about type 1 diabetes, one of the interesting factors is that you're not releasing insulin. And when you don't release insulin, you don't gain weight fast, even eating a lot of food. You lose weight very fast. Wait a minute. Well, how is that possible? How is it possible that I can consume more calories and start losing muscle and losing uh, fat and getting very thin. And it's because hormones have everything to do with what you store and what you don't store, how many calories you can burn in a day. And in, in type ones, a lot of those calories are being actually released through digestion. Sure. So, and then also menopausal women. So menopausal women, same thing, right? Their metabolisms go haywire and slow down significantly. Both the type 1 diabetic, PCOS, um, autoimmune disorders, even though really type 1 isn't autoimmune, um, people with rare and unexplained conditions, long hauler COVID, EBV, Lyme, mold, you name it, they all have one thing in common. They have what we, we call OID, uh, even menopause, all women in menopause. That's why all of their symptoms get worse because their immune system is overactive. It's called, uh, we call OID for overactive immune disorder. 
So women have a superior immune system than men. Uh, if you were to factor out between men and women's lifespans, uh, the fact that men engage in riskier behavior, if you were to fact factor that out, women still live another five to seven years, five to eight years longer than men. And the reason that they do is because of their immune systems. Uh, men will get sick and die. Women typically won't get sick, but they will struggle with way more chronic disease. So 80% of long hauler sufferers uh, are women, 80% of autoimmune sufferers are women, somewhere around 68% of the rare and unexplained conditions are women. Uh, and that's why, again, in women being underrepresented in medical research shows a huge gap in all of these women that are having all these problems. But if you look at data, they don't exist, right? So I began following this enemy from a very early age. And I go, why does menopausal women have the same symptoms as an EBV sufferer, as the same symptoms as a long hauler sufferer, as the same symptoms right. as an autoimmune sufferer? And what does that have anything to do with metabolism? Like, how could a condition affect your metabolic rate? Well, you, certain, you soon learn that all disease is metabolic. So that's why if you're a nutritionist, personal trainer, and you're able to upregulate a metabolism, you can get rid of disease. They're hand in hand oftentimes. And so uh, now I'll let you guys know, like know that then soon after I started getting all these insane results with our OID program, just results that nobody else in the industry could get, um, people started calling me a liar. And so then all of these coaches came after me and saying I was cheating or I was doing something and they tried to shut me down. and. They, they went after my family, they went after my friends, they went after my business relationships, the, 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 the mob. And then um, now, even the medical community fully acknowledges and recognizes that there's something going on with women. In fact, in the uh, Journal of Internal Medicine, uh, by some of the top doctors in the country, there was a journal on what they call IMID, immune-mediated okay. inflammatory diseases. We had to coin the condition years ago. I've been looking at this thing for over seven years now uh, because we couldn't. What we know is that your immune system can get upregulated. It can happen for many reasons. It can be vaccines. It can be trauma. It can be exposure to antibiotics or, or, al hypo or allergenic food. Um, it can be toxicity in your environment. It's usually a mixture of every one of these things. Hormonal birth control really has an effect on your immune system, which is what people don't realize is a big player in all of this. And so what happens is you start feeling brain fogged and fatigued. You start getting random hair shedding at times, maybe you get random rashing at times. You have no endurance. So your brain's like, I can do all this stuff and I go to do it and then I can't do it. Yeah. You start noticing you're swelling more. You start having iron and off gut issues. You start bloating on and off more and more. You start noticing that your metabolism doesn't work the same and you start noticing you're not responding in the gym. You start noticing that the same diet doesn't work anymore and you start realizing you're getting skinny fat somehow or softer. You're not losing weight, but you're also not as hard as you were before. Um, and then other conditions can come up. Leaky gut, you know, again, you know, uh, IBS. Um, though usually these people get a hypothyroid diagnosis, which has nothing to do with what's actually going on. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Hormones get really off. And that's because in a woman, their, their immune system are, are so aggressive that if it gets triggered too much, it can get way over aggressive. Okay. And because T and B cell lymphocytes that exist in the body have more estrogen receptor sites, they don't, androgens calm the immune system. Estrogens, whether they go too high or go too low, mm. activate the immune system. That's why if you look up immune related conditions in menopause, you'll see there's a systemic huge boom that once you go into menopause, because when you go to zero estrogen, right. the immune system gets more active. That's why things like that, anything that lowers estrogen, uh, like uh, anti-estrogens, um, depo shot, Adderall, all of these things have been significantly uh, linked to autoimmune disorders. Because once you get your, and that's that same thing with chronic dieting, if you chronic diet and you get your estrogen to zero and you simulate menopause, you can create disease if you stay there too long. So that's why one of the most diseased populations of women are natural bodybuilding females. 
because they live in a low estrogen, high stress, high physical impact environment for a very, very long time. And that's why you see so much problem in them. And you, you think there's a lot of them, but a one in three end up with issues. Easy. If not 50%. And the problem is, is that fixing that means you've got to calm the immune system down. We've created a proprietary way to do that. Um, and now, Krista, because of that, we have a 97% success rate on all conditions on planet Earth. Our programs come with a guarantee. You come work with me. I don't care anybody listening to this. If you have something that nobody can fix, I will give you significant progress in 12 weeks or less, or I will do it for free. No one else, no one else is going to say that. No coach would ever say that because... You never know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen because we know the problem is if I can calm the immune system now, mm -hmm. all that cellular inflammation drops and your metabolism goes way up. And then, and then these people go back to eating 1800 calories without gaining weight. It's called, the condition's called immunosenescence. It might be something worth people looking up. There's a whole field of biology called immunometabolism. And it's like when your immune system is hyper uh, overactive, you start running on sugar, even when you try to cut your calories, right. even when you try to go into a fat burning state, you can't, you're running on sugar and it's eating your muscle. So the more I try to just cut my calories, the more muscle that I lose. And it messes with insulin sensitivity. Even if you're eating healthy and you're not someone who's ate like a type two diabetic, your insulin doesn't work very well. It's either too low or too high. And that's the truth. And that's called OID. It's a real thing. It's affecting more and more Amer millions of Americans between infertility, autoimmune disorder, long haul or COVID, things they call EBV or chronic Lyme or whatever it is. It's OID and we can solve it. And that's why I'm going on every podcast everywhere because we got the answer and I'm willing to put it on the line. I'll cover it if I can't fix it. And can you talk me through this might be a bit of a loaded question, so you can take it in any direction you want. But I think that's something just that's really interesting in observing, you know, some of the uh, mutual friends that we have and even like watching Sonia go through her own journey with this and her then talk about like how it's shifted, how she thinks about things in coaching. She did a post or maybe it was a story recently talking about like changing her mind on taking, say, a ketogenic approach because there's certain situations where that makes sense. I'd love for you to kind of explain when you're dealing with somebody and they're coming to you and they're describing a lot of the different symptoms that you shared, where do you have them start in terms of figuring out and even getting them to be open-minded to experimentation? Because I think that's probably a hard part of it too, right? Like we talked about at the very beginning of this conversation, establishing trust. I think that's so key when somebody is coming to you they feel like they've tried everything. They feel like they've talked to people who aren't listening to them. They know something's not right. And then you may be throwing ideas at them that they've thought for various reasons at other points don't make sense or they're convinced might not work. Yeah. So, you know, I think the first thing is, is that people need to understand that the, <clears throat> the most important thing about actual success is psychological and not physiological. Yeah. So you need, I don't care what the science says. I don't care what, um, you know, uh, a program is going to tell you what you need to do is first get them a quick win. That matters first. You have to get them a quick win, but you can't do it doing more of the same stuff you've always been doing or they've always been doing. And that's where I discovered my first diet system that I trademarked called the flush which we teach at our university. And um, it's, a, it's if you use a little bit of functional medicine and you stimulate the endocrine system and the GI tract and, and a few other things in the adrenals, and you rotate the diet into really simple carbs, high carb, heavy, low protein, mild, like more Mediterranean. Okay. You can reignite the metabolism, feed them more and they'll lose weight. 95% of people will lose weight within the first 12 weeks, feeding them more. So it serves two purposes. One, I got a little bit of weight loss. So I got a quick win. You feel amazing. And then two, I've now started with a higher basal metabolic rate right. to work with as a coach. And no one else has been able to do that. We were able to do that. And that was one of the reasons that I launched the university where I teach coaches these methods because it's like everyone's stuck with the same problems. Um, how do I get them a quick win without making them worse? Uh, and we know how to do that. Uh, and so that's kind of where it starts. So you got to get them a quick win. Now, I always go Mediterranean first. Mediterranean, because I'm a big fan of what's called diet variation. 
So it's very important to me that my, my client eats foods that they have not ate before because I believe in microbiome diversity. Sure. And I know how much the research shows it can impact metabolism, right? Uh, plus, I like to detox the body first. So I'm a big, I like to flush it. I like to get real blow. I like to, I like to get them feeling good. And I like to do a bit of a reverse. So, so I'm going to hit them with a quick reverse. I'm going to flush them, right, with that. And then I'm going to decide based on their glucose levels uh, where they're at, what nutritional system they need next. So every diet system is a tool. Keto can be very effective. Carnivore can be very effective. Uh, Mediterranean pescatarian probably is the best place to be long term as a lifestyle, and the reason it is is because it has the most diversity within inside the diet, right? Um, and then usually what we end up doing is that after we put people through a Mediterranean program, we need to move to an autophagy program. So autophagy is for self healing. It's it's uh, it runs on AMPK energy systems, which is more fat metabolism, and again gets rid of more you know, oxidative stress and inflammation. So you can, you can create that through either a ketogenic diet. You can sometimes, depending if their sugars are low enough, you can do it in a carnivore diet. Um, and so we'll rotate some of that stuff in because we're creating variation. We'll drop the calories a little bit doing that. We'll watch their glucose levels. We can, and their ketones, so we can measure how much fat they're kind of burning. And then we're able to there make adjustments based on their biofeedback and then navigate them into success. And then once you've gotten rid of all that extra fat, you've gotten rid of a lot of that inflammation, people will see that they'll be able to eat way more calories and not gain the weight back because that's what matters most, right? Sure, people are going to gain weight naturally. You'll probably gain one pound a year. Sure. But if you have a good metabolism that works, you should easily be able to cut your calories back a little bit and drop it. This is the part that everyone wants to ignore. It's like, oh, everyone's overeating when they get out of a diet plan. Well, yeah, it's because their metabolism screwed up. And now eating normal amounts of food like they used to doesn't work, right? So, of course, they're going to gain weight. So, my whole argument is let's build up people's metabolic capacity, fix them functionally so that all of their systems work correctly, which will raise their metabolic rate. Now, you send them back out in the world and they don't have to worry about dealing with a crippled metabolism and rapidly gaining weight and having to come back again and do it all over again, right? Now there is a portion of the of population, a good 40 to 50%, that just lives a very sedentary lifestyle mm -hmm. and is overeating. And so I would say to those people, eat less, move more, it's great, perfect, great. Uh, wonderful. But if it starts to not work, or if you start noticing your metabolism is slowing down, or if you start to notice that you seem to be accumulating fat faster than you did before, that would be a time to start looking at functional nutrition or looking at hormones or someone who can work those systems. That's why I like functional health coaches that can work, that can work that and provide you a path where you lose weight, but balance your body back out so that you don't go back out in the world and keep doing the vicious cycle over and over and over and over again, you know? Yeah. Because I it's, think not working. it's not working. We right. diet more than anywhere in the world, and we have the and most yet, look at our, exactly. biomass per capita of anywhere in the world. So the more we spend on dieting, the worse off we are. Just like in medicine. Medicine's the same thing, right? The, the more doctors, more research, more health uh, networks, the sicker we get, right? Because there's, a, there's almost an inverse relationship. And that's because healing doesn't necessarily happen in Western medicine. Right. And, and, and same thing, long-term weight loss doesn't happen in standard nutritional diet for many people. And that's where, you know, now we've got, that's why I've got a lot of books coming out. Our first book should come out by the end of the year called the flush method. Nice. Um, then we've got the feast fast method coming out uh, to explain to people how they do caloric deficits uh, correctly. And like I said, we, we are, aggressively trying to pioneer um, a, a new fitness and health industry to guide people in the best ways possible and change the national conversation about what, what real health looks like and how to maintain weight. I think the really important distinction here that we're saying, but like without coming out and saying it directly, right, is 
to reference the population you mentioned before, that there are people who are sedentary, that they should be paying attention to moving their bodies and, and starting there is like, it's important that we look at your baseline and also how much information we're gathering about that, right? Like I think, and you've even referenced this in talking about being willing to experiment too, to figure out what works. What I find for a lot of people is they're confused and there's so much information out there. They want to know how certain things apply to them. And it's for the best intent because they want to see results. They want that win. They want to feel healthier, but we can come at this from a much more educated place when we set those baselines and say, Hey, like, what is your standard that you're living with on a daily basis in terms of how you're moving your body, what types of food choices you're making, how much sleep you're getting and making sure those things are all in a really good spot. And something that I've really tried to focus on more with my clients is like doing that from a place because it makes you feel good, not just because we're chasing this, you know, certain outcome with losing a certain amount of body fat, building a certain amount of muscle, seeing a new number on the scale, because in order for those things to happen that we really want, all of that other stuff should be in a solid spot. But then you run up against the fact that like, okay, are there reasons why you're not in a good place with those things? And how can we really look at your habits and what you're thinking, like the stories that you're telling yourself? I want to make sure we go back to this because that's something that I've really found for me personally in the last year. I've always had some kind of nutrition coach over the course of the last few years, but in January of this year, I started working with more of a like self-development and mindset type of coach and having the space and structure and routine to help me really look at what are the stories that I'm telling myself have just influenced the decisions that I make that when it comes to approaching my own dieting phases, they feel a lot easier because I'm looking at it from a different perspective too. Yeah. So there's the, there's the coaching of, of health programs. And then there's the, the functional program. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the most important thing is I told you is the psychology, right? right? So we're talking heavily about functional medicine. One of the things when we talk about root cause is mindset, right? Is, um, is everything to do with identity and the mm -hmm. narratives that we tell ourselves. Um, I believe that most coaches should spend their time focused on that, but the programming should be functional. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. So that because that's, and that's what we're, I'm creating more mindset tools than anything now because people need less of the programs mm -hmm. and they need more belief that they can do the programs. Yeah. I right? and believe that their body can heal and that your body can work for them and not against them and all of those things. Um, but the, it's the blend of both those because what I have learned is the body is fundamentally made of 11 systems. Okay. Those 11 systems, when you are a endocrinologist, all you're working is the endocrine system. That's one out of 11. If I'm a personal trainer, all I'm working is the musculoskeletal system, right? That's one out of 11. If I am a GI doctor, I'm working the gastrointestinal system. The problem, the reason that most people do not get the results that they want is they're not taking a multi-system approach. So silo. So, right. So like the, you know, the, the neurology of a problem is very important, right? So that's where you're getting the mindset and all the other things. But so you need to work with somebody. That's why root cause matters. That's why functional practitioners, if I work all 11 systems, Krista, to be balanced, I'm going to improve your metabolic rate by anywhere from three to 10%. That little bit of difference every single day is the difference between whether you live a happy, healthy life, maintaining your weight and being free of disease or always living this cycle of gaining and, oh, you know, trying to get the same seven pounds off and always being behind and never being fully present and being the, the person you see yourself in the inside on the outside. And really the relationship then is both mental and physical. And you're not, what are you going to do, Krista? You're going to go see a therapist, dietitian, functional health practitioner. That's not real. They think that you should do that in medicine now. No one does that. There's not a Cleveland clinic where you can get all the practitioners in all one. All at once, right. This. I created my own functional health network called Vital, uh, Vital Network, 
where the coaching company does it for you. They do the mindset. They do all the functional work. They have medical teams on staff that if we need prescriptions or hormones or peptides, they handle them all in one place so that you can work multiple modalities at one time to fully 360 balance the body again so that you can go back out in the world. And that's where everybody needs to go. And I think it needs to be coached. Healing is coached, right? That's why the most effective tool in medicine is a nurse. But if you fully, you know, empower them with coaching tools, they become a coach. And become, that's why some of the best coaches are nurses. Um, getting them out of the Western medical system and putting them into a career that actually makes them money and allows them to work from home, helping others. But that's why the future of health is coaching. Everything in the future, in the next 10 years, if it's not given by AI, it'll be given by a coach. And people need to be prepared for that because that's what's coming. That's why I know we're building all the health networks and the system now to um, be a player in that game. I love that. And my dog is joining the podcast. Hello. <laughs> this is Bean. Say hi. Bean. <laughs> um, I would love to know, because I think this is an important thing for us to touch on too and hear your perspective on this. You know, a lot of people come to the coaching space and we have a conversation about them understanding that this is a true investment in their health and seeing that portion of it, right? And understanding that, hey, this isn't like, let me throw a couple hundred dollars at this and hope something works and hope that it sticks. And I'd love to know your kind of rebuttal to the person that's like, wow, this is a really big chunk of change or a big investment for me to make, especially in comparison, I'm sorry, to the um, future medical bills that they could be facing if they don't deal with what they're, they're facing right now. So some of it has everything to do with a value proposition. So people don't understand how to value coaching. So they don't know what it is. So they don't know how to value it, which is why most of the 75% of Americans have never heard of functional health coaching, no. nutrition coaching. They have no idea. So they have no idea how to value it. So that's why, you know, giving people experiences and, you know, maybe their neighbor's trying it for the first time or they see something on social media, it starts to normalize. It. That's what I want to happen. First thing is they've got to normalize it so people know how to value it. You know, people many years ago would have never paid $200 a session for therapy and now sure. you see it all the time. Yeah. Great. So first, it's the normalization to know how to value something. Second is the value proposition that people don't understand is that healthcare has been perceived as free because of insurance. So my health is not really of my care and, and is of the care of a system that I, you know, I have to pay a certain amount to, but the rest is covered, right? So, so for the perceived value. So it's really, it's incumbent upon the coach to work through some of those challenges to help people understand because they don't understand. It's not that they don't want to buy your sit. They're on the call with you. They want to buy, they, right. want to, they want to buy from you, but you have to help them understand and work through the logic and the means to be able to do it. So a lot of times if somebody comes to the call and I say, Mrs. Jones, how much are you willing to invest in your health? and they say $200 a month, I'll say to them simply, okay, well, this program is maybe $600 a month. I'll price anchor them, you know, 700 or worth, it's worth up to $1,000 a month. Oh, well, that's too much. Well, Mrs. Jones, I'm sorry. I don't know how many problems we've ever solved at $200. I thought you were here to solve a big problem. What you told me is that your entire life has been hindered by your being overweight. What you've told me is you're tired of struggling with your energy and you want to feel like your old self again. What you've told me is X, Y, and Z. And I'm saying to myself, if I throw $200 at this problem, is that going to solve it? Because what you told me is it's a big problem. I mean, everything that you just told me, and that's why in a call, don't be thinking about the sale, be thinking about the consumer and how to help them because they have me stuck in not understanding if they could understand what's coming on at the end of the 12 weeks or 16 weeks, everyone would buy. Yeah. So don't blame them, help them, right? And so you have to work through a series of mind logic and identity uh, um, uh, exercises 
that help people recognize that like, oh, if I cut back to eating out once a week, I don't buy that beer, I don't do this, I don't do that, I just save 200 extra dollars. And the problem that I have, you're right. If I have a real problem going on and I just try to throw a little something at it, I'm not really taking it serious. Mm -hmm. And I, we have real statistics. So we, we polled like, we took 4,000 people and we looked at the different price rates we, we gave people. People that pay under $300 are over like 50% less likely to get the desired outcome than someone who pays anywhere upwards of four to 700. I totally believe so like, Yeah. And then we did, we did 24 people where we gave 12 people it for free and 12 people it for 5K. 12 out of 12 successful for the 5K. One out of 12 in the free. Because people's perception of what it is will imply their investment, their physical investment. People can buy your program, but not be bought into you. Sure. So what has to happen is that people have to be willing to lay a little bit on the line because when they do, it ensures the outcome. So that's why I don't have a problem raising my price a lot of times. But I'm also aware that people have no understanding of how to value it. So a lot of times we'll do one-offs, we'll do a course with a coaching session, we'll do consults with coaching in them so that people can get the experience so that they know how to value it. Right. Right. And so that's the whole game of, of how you do those kind of different freebies, top of funnel, how you do your different challenges and your different things to give people the experience. So they go, oh, this is worth $15 a day, you know, because the reality is even at, at you know, at $15 a day, that's a $450 program. Right. You can't spend $15 a day. Like your, your problem, everything you just said to me how important it is. And I'm saying that we could solve this over time with $15 a day. Would you not commit to that, Mrs. Jones? So putting them through the logically, you know, we're not, are we going to be one of the, you know, we don't want to be one of those people that comes and shows them and says they're going to do something and then isn't willing to in invest in the thing that's going to do the thing that they so desire most and just wish somebody could help them get through. Right. We're not one of those people. Are we Mrs. Jones? You know what I mean? Like, you know, because creating framing identities, so that they can see the difference in the logic. And that comes into all of your, if you can't close, you can't coach. That's my personal opinion. I think that's, I, I think that's a really, I've never heard anybody say it that way, but I think that's a totally fair statement, right? Because yeah. it's when you frame it in that identity shift, like that's what you're really getting someone to see is possible for them. And, you know, to bring it back to the fact of like, hey, you've described to me that, you're feeling this sort of pain. You're feeling this stuckness. Like it is, as you said, a true problem and let's solve that problem for you. And I, I just think it's interesting the point that you made about, um, you know, therapy sessions and like how now they're in a place where they're valued when years ago, that wasn't necessarily a thing. I think that's an exciting aspect about there being a lot of coaches out there. However, there's the other side of it of making sure that those are good coaches too, right? Because there's nothing worse. Like when I have the experience of bringing in a client who is coming to me from a really bad coaching experience, like I love the opportunity of course, to be able to help them, but it is disheartening to know that they're coming from a place of additional pain because they went through this other experience that, you know, for whatever reason, wasn't the right fit, didn't work for them, et cetera. And I think that really obviously speaks to your greater mission that you've talked about here in trying to bring more of this education to coaches and getting them to understand what functional nutrition means and what that looks like and how it can be integrated into your coaching practice. So asking this question more for the coach listening to this, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, there's coaches out there who like, they say calories in calories out to some degree. And they're the person who's maybe working with a young female or mostly male population. And they don't necessarily want to touch this area to the coach who recognizes that there could be more that they could be doing for their clients and knowing they could get them better results and truly wants to help them talk us through what it looks like to be a part of 
um, some of your coursework and mentorship and coaching, because obviously that is the bigger goal of conversations same like thing, these, though. right? Same thing, like psychology. A lot of people don't believe they can do it. It seems like yeah. a lot. People suffer from imposter syndrome. They think if I don't know everything about same. everything, I'm right. qualified to start doing something. Mm -hmm. um, we've made it so easy. At our university, our level one program is going to give you tools you can use immediately that will create immediate outcomes. And you can pretty much do it and do sales at different times. You can do it when a payment plan for like anywhere between two and a half to like 4K. Full level one certification and functional health coaching. You're going to walk away immediately with actionable tools. We have in person our, our, um, we have our um, advisors and then also our instructors with live classroom group training, or you can do it self-paced mm -hmm. and will immediately for a very low monthly investment, give you immediate return. There's nobody that goes through a level one that doesn't get better outcomes with their clients and then bring in more clients. I promise you by the time you're done with the 13 weeks of the level one, you have more clients than you start, right? Because some simple changes in what you do will create mega outcomes. Then you can trust that this is the way to go. Sure. And, and more trust in start. yourself. Yes. And then you can invest and get into level two and level three and you can get more advanced and then you can get specific. I want to do fertility. I want to do thyroid. I want to do hormones. We do everything we are the best at at our university. And we, but we, we have a level one experience that gives you immediate wins that we practice. We solve the cases for you. We have live case studies solving your cases. No other university does it. No one. There's nobody right now that you can go to this legitimate certification that will touch your cases. They're afraid of liability and whatever else. We say, hell with that. We don't care. We will solve your cases with you so you can learn. I'm someone who learns hands-on. Yeah. I can't just read something about thyroid and then go no. apply it in a program and know it's going to work. No, it's a trade school healing and coaching. Hands-on. That's what we do. No one else does that. So the fact that if anybody has ever got any apprehension, that's why you have to go there and experience it for yourself. There's not anyone that goes through MMU now that you're going to say it wasn't worth it. Not one, right? And uh, that's why the, the learning process we've created ensures you can only build on small wins. So we don't want people to overcommit and come give us $40,000. and We're going to promise all this shit. No, no, no. Come give us a little bit. We'll give you massive value. And then you can trust taking your journey further and further and further. And then that's how you're going to separate yourself. You know, there, there isn't a functional coach that doesn't have more clients because they're functional, get better results, has a better career on their own, you know, has more impact in their community. I had no idea. I used to be a prep coach and a weight loss coach. I was making good money. Everything changed. My entire career changed because I went functional. I know it works and I've got a stack the size of the Empire State Building of evidence that this works. You know, so nobody, I'm at that place where I, I bump heads with some of these people who are, you know, pretty strict CICO people. But my evidence of success is so large, it's very hard to deny. It. What would you say going back to Vince, the prep coach, what would you say to him now? Like if you had ever expected to go on this path and this journey, what would you say to that version of you? There's nothing wrong with pushing people to the max, but it is your fidu fiduciary responsibility to protect people from themselves. And if you choose not to honor that as a dereliction of your duty as a guide, it may not be illegal, but it is immoral. And that's the truth. Now that doesn't mean if people want to go to the limit, you don't try to go there, but you better damn well be thinking heavily about how do I make sure that they, we don't hurt them and that we don't leave the trail of damaged people after the fact. If you and I make an agreement that you want to take it to the limit, we'll take it to the limit if we need to. Some Every rule in nutrition was meant to be broken in different circumstances for different people. But the fact is, if you're not always thinking about how to protect them against themselves, shame on you. And if you're not doing enough to learn some of the things that might help them because you're unwilling to learn anything else, shame on you. And that's the truth. You know, I'm not going to tell you you need to stop coaching or you're the enemy and anything, but, but at the same token, there's more that you can do and you're not. And that's a shame. From this big picture perspective of, you know, having 
this true holistic space for people to come to as both the consumer, but then also to help with the education side of things, to have this movement, to make these changes to the way we think about healthcare and medicine. What goal do you have in terms of all of the research you're collecting by having so many case studies and so many people that you work with so that we can get to a point where we're not making the comments we have been making about the fact that women are so underrepresented in terms of nutritional research and things like that. Yeah. So there's, there's two types of people, there's researchers and then there's doers. And the problem is the doers are so busy doing that they don't do the research and the researchers are so busy researching that they actually don't, don't do, the, do doing. The, thing that the researching. Yeah, fair point. So you, you run into these interesting uh, scenarios where I've talked to many labs. I've considered partnering with some of them, but then you've got to get funding in the money. And I would rather spend my time building the case study evidence and then and then building it large enough that it that it can that it is there to be education and a, and a resource. We've looked at bringing on people that can document it. Mm-hmm. And then maybe running some some studies uh, in USF or a couple other places like that. As my the only way you can do that, Krista, though, is with a lot of money. Yeah. And the only way you can get a lot of money is a lot of scale, and that means a lot of scale means a lot of doing, or going and getting other people's money, which takes a lot of time too. And I right now I'm just busy trying to help as many people and launch as many businesses. We launch a lot of we have a business builder in our university. We have. You know, I'm trying to build my army because I'm I'm not going to try to convince the medical world that this is real. I'm just going to build an army so big that I can't be ignored. And that's what the one in 100 is. You guys can check it out on Facebook, one in 100.com or one in 100 Facebook or check it out at metabolicmentor.com. And we're just going to build a lot of like-minded people and become a community because all holistic practitioners, they're all on their own. They're all like lone wolves on yep. their own little soapbox. And your voice is so blocked from all the other noise because everybody else is in groups. And so everyone else's voice is so much louder. Mm -hmm. We need to change that. We need to come together collectively and we're going to be a lot stronger that way. And that way in the future, functional medicine will be the norm. I promise you that probably looking at another 10 years, but same thing like fish oil and vitamin D. It's like, Oh, you don't know about like hormones and functional health. Like, how do you not know about that? That's where it's going. And I've always been right. And everybody's demonized me 18 years ago. <laughs> they try to say I was a heretic and, you know, no gyms wanted me to go to their gym anymore as a bodybuilding coach. Uh, I got, I got picked on when I went to a competitions, the, the medical doctors that I worked with that were some of my clients when I got too big and I went out on my own, they went against me and they tried to bring the medical board against me and they tried to uh, shut me down and try to tell other practitioners not to work with me. And yet, here I am because I don't need anyone else's permission. Um, you know, we've got our own medical clinics. We teach doctors at our university and I'm not a licensed practitioner. Mm-hmm. I'm just obsessed. I study, I, I practice, we get the case study evidence. And then we have other, other, we have Dr. Kerry John, we have other doctors and licensed uh, uh, physicians that also see what we're talking about. And also then, you know, we can leverage those relationships to, to do the things that we need to do in, in the medical field. I don't need to be a doctor to have impact because I don't need their permission and neither do you. I love that. And I want to be respectful of your time too. So I'm going to bring us to our last couple of questions here. Okay. If somebody out there is listening to this and there is only one takeaway that they could have from this conversation, what do you want that to be? Um, diet variation, cycle, everything. If you're, if you're going to, if you're going to diet a lot, you need to be in a surplus, at least, you know, uh, you know, for four to eight week intervals. Um, you can go to, if you want to try to reset your metabolism, I have a simple course that comes with a coaching session. It's called, uh, it's called the flush. Um, you can check it out at vitalcoaching.com. It's like 197 bucks. It'll change your life. Um, so you can learn how you can reset your metabolic rate. Um, if you're, if you're dealing with, you know, unexplained health issues, um, it's best to see a functional practitioner. Don't keep going the same old nutritional routes. Um, and if you're somebody who really loves this stuff, I don't care if you work at 
Denny's. I don't care if you work at Lowe's. I don't care if you're a school teacher. I don't care if you're a nurse. I don't care if you're already a coach and you really want to try to do more because you don't like just doing weight loss all day long. Any one of you can build a career making six figures from home uh, over time, um, getting into something that really changes lives like functional health or health coaching or nutrition coaching. And you can get the license or the certification and the experience hands-on over at our university, Metabolic Mentor University. You can check out Metabolic Mentor. Com. Perfect. Well, I will be sure to link all of that down in the show notes too, so that it's easily accessible. And I really appreciate your time, your energy behind this and your perspective and just willingness to say, Hey, like this, yes, we have these, you know, micro situations that down to the individual on a daily basis that you've seen and experienced not only for yourself, but also from so many people that you've worked with, but being able to say, Hey, like we have this greater responsibility here that if we figured these things out and they know that they work to come up with a way to put those tools in as many people's hands, not only to empower the professional, but also to empower individuals to take ownership of their health. I mean, I think that's my biggest takeaway from this one-on-one conversation with you, but even other content that I've seen you put out and just thinking through like those scenarios of someone's being in a doctor's office. Like I think so much of it comes back to this feeling of like someone thinking just because this medical professional told me I should do this or thinks this or can't figure out what's wrong with me. It is what it is. And it takes some fear, right? Like of saying, well, I guess that's it, but it's your body and you only have one life and wanting to truly help people like feel their absolute best is something that I think every coach and anybody doing anything in the nutrition, fitness, health, wellness space, whatever you want to call it, that should be at the forefront of how they think about working with their clients. Everybody that complains about the Western medical system and how messed, things up, messed up things are, if we took every single personal trainer that exists right now and we gave them functional tools, there would be one person for every hundred in the United States. And that would be the same as nursing. And it would have a radical shift in the American, average American health and can have a radical impact on the way our health is going. Everybody sees the problem. Yeah. We are going down fast. Every known known disease to humankind is growing at all time rates. By 2030, seven out of 10 people in the United States and globally will be struck with some form of lifestyle disease that significantly impacts their, their way of life, vitality, hope, love, all of those things. And everybody sits back idly by acting like it's somebody else's problem, but nobody else is doing about anything about it because everyone's capitalizing off of it. Yet you go to any gym in the country and there'll be 20 people in there just dying to help someone else get help the way they did. And if you take every one of them and you equip them with a few functional medicine tools, they can go out there and heal almost any condition at any time. We are not that far away from our own integrated community of our own solution. If people who actually heard this message decided to actually step up, I am living proof. I was a personal trainer now with an ecosystem that's touched millions. And I'm no different than the average meathead down the street that was just looking to um, really, I was looking for significance in the way that I helped others. And that's all I need. And we could easily build a movement off of that. You know? Yeah. Hey, I can't think of a better mic drop moment to stop us there. So thank you. And to everybody listening to this, I think that's also a important reminder to share these podcasts because that's the way that we can reach as many people as possible, right? If there's anything Uh, in here that resonated with you that you want to talk to somebody about it with, start the conversation in your own home, friend groups, your social circles, all of it counts and all of it makes a big difference. So Vince, thank you again for your time. I am excited to check out all of your resources and apparently being is too. (laughs) So for everybody who tuned in today, we appreciate you guys. And from wherever you are listening from, as always, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Vince.